Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack a Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another episode of Kirk Your Enthusiasm. I am joined today by a person I've known for a very long time. Uh, he is one of the most prolific basketball and sports writers on the internet. If you don't know Jared Dubin, then you are doing Twitter wrong. He is a contributor at 538, fan sided. He writes about football for CBS. He does his own. Uh, Patreon, which we're going to circle back on to later in the show, um, that is just incredible. Uh, that that covers you know uh, the the previous night's basketball in in 500 words or less and some video. It's really really incredible. Um, go to the link in the story. I'm going to put all this stuff in there so you can see Jared if you don't know. Uh, I wanted to uh, bring Jared on today to talk a little bit about the upcoming Knicks game. Chris Stapps Porzingis, how you doing today, guy? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Thanks for the uh, extensive introduction and uh, listing well, of credentials. I guess <laughs> you've you've been you know you Knicks guys. You know you're the one that I talk to the most. But there's about five of you Knicks folks who I follow online who I've wanted to have on about Porzingis since I started the show. But I needed to get some actual film under my belt in terms of watching Porzingis now, and also you know not. I didn't really want to spoil anything because when it comes to Porzingis, there's a lot of projection uh, that people do. And just because he's such a unique player, he comes to, you know, he played in a huge market and he, you know, you know, he's, he's just a really unique situation. So it's, he's a guy that, that I don't really know how to talk about yet. And I'm, I'm loath to throw things out there because I think I could be, you know, at once very right. And then also very wrong. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, because we it, had it, talked it, about doing this, I think going back to before you even started the podcast, like May, it was, it yeah. was kind of ridiculous. I just want to talk about it because, you know, I watched him, uh, the first summer league and that was the extent of my KP firsthand experience. That wasn't highlights for the better part of two years. Cause I just didn't catch many Knicks games. Um, why would you, they were atrocious. Like, but he he was <laughs> such an I mean he struggled that summer league where it looked like a oh boy kind of pick uh, with the you know he had the occasional flourish if I'm remembering correctly he had um he played pretty well there if unless I'm misremembering no, he had like I, a a, he, he a must good have done battle something. against Okafor in the first game that's um, what it was okay and Okafor kind of looked like uh that it was the red flags for him mm-hmm. Yeah, because there was some great offensive rebounding, and you know, just he looked a lot more ready to play than people were than people were. He kept getting like tip dunks and things like that, and then he came into training camp, and sort of the expectation I think for most fans coming into the season was that he was going to be not necessarily a full time starter and sort of ease his way in, and instead, right from the beginning, he was a full time starter and kind of awesome from Mm -hmm. the start, and that sort of led to a pattern for him during all of his seasons in New York, where for the first like month and a half, two months of the season, he was just incredible. And then he would suffer some sort of minor injury and it would, you know, make his shooting numbers and his rebounding numbers take a dip. And then, you know, he would have all sorts of injuries throughout the rest of the year. And obviously in the third year, there was a a season ending injury that kept him out for obviously all of last season as well, but he sort of followed the same pattern in all three seasons. He came out like, gangbusters and look like a guy who was going to make the all-star team and then would suffer some sort of lower body injury that would affect him you know noticeably for the rest of the way 
Well, so you you wrote, and you were one of the first people I know that really addressed the recurring lower mm-hmm. body injuries with him. Was it, you know, from what you remember, you know, talking to to Jeff Stotts and in street clothes, you know, mm-hmm. were, were these things connected or were they, you know, what how how did all that go down? Like, what exactly were you seeing when he was, you know, in his first two years? So basically during his rookie season, um, I was doing a lot of Knicks coverage for Bleacher Report at the time. And obviously he was the focus of a lot of that coverage because he was just way better than anybody expected him to be right away. So I was doing a lot of things about how he affected the defense, how he affected Carmelo Anthony, how he affected all sorts of different things. And one of the things that we decided to write about was, you know, because he's so big, seven foot three, there was a lot of concern about injuries with him. Um, And he played, I think, the first like 50 something games of his career. He didn't miss any games. And then the first game he missed was for like an upper respiratory infection, not even for an injury. And he was playing through all of these like seemingly minor lower body injuries, like a, you know, sprained foot or, uh, or not sprained foot, but like bruised foot, bruised knee, like strained calf, things like that. And the thing I noticed during the reporting of this piece where I talked to KP, I talked to um, other big men around the league about how they did or didn't stay healthy throughout their careers. I talked to guys like... um, I talked to guys like uh, Marc Gasol, who, uh, you know, was playing with... uh, a big guy playing with the Spanish national team. Um, I talked to Robin Lopez, who was on the Knicks at the time, who was a big guy who stayed relatively healthy for most of his career. I talked to big guys that didn't stay healthy, um, things like that. And um, one of the things that I noticed during the reporting of that piece was that all of those lower body injuries that he suffered during his rookie year were on the left side of his body. So, I talked to Jeff Stotts about that, and he one of the things that he raised was the importance of finding out whether these all really were random injuries. You know, KP himself said he wasn't worried about the fact that they were all left side injuries. Um, I asked the coach at the time, Derek Fisher, if he was worried about that. He said that he wasn't. Um, and Stotts's big concern was, you know, is this a weakness in the kinetic chain? And if so, you have to address it. And if it's just random, well, you know, then it's just random. And uh, that was something that came up uh, pretty significantly when he finally suffered a torn ACL in his left knee. There were a bunch of people that went back and found that story and were like, well, I guess, you know, it may have been a weakness in the kinetic chain or systemic or something like that. So from a, this is where we're dipping. I I try to avoid narrative stuff just because I often don't know what I'm talking about. But with people who are in on things, I at least think it's worth dipping into a little bit. When things started to go sour with the relationship between the Knicks and Porzingis, was it before the ACL tear or was it oh, after? Definitely. Oh, so, okay. So it was. So what was mm-hmm. happening before the injuries that the injury seems to really just like speed up in terms of, you know, timetable for him to eventually leave? Yeah. I mean, there was. Uh, a fracture, I guess you would say, in the relationship between KP and his brother, who's also his agent, um, and Phil Jackson, I would say, or at the front office as a whole. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess that led to, a, you know, the obviously the skipped exit meeting at the end of that season, which sort of blew the whole thing up in terms of the relationship between KP and the team. And then there was, you know, I would say there were efforts, obviously, to repair that relationship that were made by you know steve mills and scott perry and even david fisdell uh in his short time that he had with kp you know he went to to travel to latvia to work him out a little bit um but i would just say that the relationship with phil jackson and that going south sort of took the relationship with the team as a whole south and i don't think it ever i wouldn't say that it ever recovered um, there was, you know, a little bit of a, a thawing, I guess, where it wasn't quite as bad as it was under Phil. Um, but I think that was sort of the start of it. So was that in, in terms of repairing the relationship, looking back now, do you think that was the sort of thing that 
he and his brother and, you know, the, the people he surrounds himself with had more or less made their mind up about to start uh, uh, the 2018-19 the season. Or did something evolve? You know, we, we know about the, 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 you know, we don't talk about it much on this podcast just because it doesn't come up, but the, the sexual assault accusation and the way that the team may or may not have helped him. Like, did this stuff all just really roll into one big issue that he was unhappy and then, because uh, it, it looks like in retrospect, there really might not have been any opportunity to repair the relationship. Is that a fair read? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't around the team quite as much last season because I just simply didn't spend as much time at the Garden because the team was, was bad, not very, <laughs> was not very good. And I live two blocks from Barclays, so I just naturally go to more Nets games than Knicks games now just because it's much easier for me. Um, and in the, the second half, you know, 2017 and 2018, I had physical ailments that prevented me from going to games cause I was just rehabbing all the time. Um, so I, I wasn't around the team as much. I can't speak with personal experience to how, uh, the sexual assault allegation and whether or not the team helped him with it or not affected the relationship simply because yeah. I, I wasn't there. And also nobody knew about it until yeah, that was really shortly well hidden after the trade last season. Um, so I, I can't really speak to how or whether that affected the relationship. I do think that there were, I don't want to say that they necessarily 100% had their minds made up by the start of the season, but certainly by that meeting a few days before the trade deadline, they had their minds made up. And you know, the, I think it's been reported they essentially came into that meeting and said they didn't want to um, continue on with that relationship. And I think the Knicks from their end, um, understood that it was his intention to leave at some point. Um, and whether that was realistic in terms of taking the qualifying offer or not, they decided that the discussions that they had been having, and like anybody with the Knicks that says they weren't having discussions before that, like they're lying to you, especially <laughs> considering the game trade together. Like later that day, the teams were playing each other the night before. Like, they had been having discussions. I know that they had had discussions with other non Mavericks teams. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there were reports after the trade happened that some teams would have liked to have been contacted, but just because those teams weren't contacted doesn't mean that other teams didn't contact the Knicks or other team, the Knicks didn't contact other teams. So I don't know that their mind was necessarily made up going into last season, but certainly by the time, that report came out of, you know, he's requested a trade, which was very shortly followed by he's been traded. I think obviously the mind had been made up by that point and the Knicks minds had been made up that they were going to acquiesce to that. Sure. Yeah. That was, it's such an odd thing that I, I think one day we'll get a more definitive uh, look at what happened and how that came together. Uh, but it might, it might be a while where we know the, the specific ins and outs, but it was, it was so it was just so odd that it happened like that because I, I, I still remember being, being in awe of it with the way it went down. Um, well, so we, we, I would just you know, say just quickly, I would th say that if we do get more information about it, it's going to come from Porzingis uh -huh. Porzingis and his brother or from the Mavericks, because I mean, on the Knicks side, it's Steve Mills who obviously has been with the Knicks in one capacity or another for a long time with the exception of a few year period or like James Dolan. And obviously James Dolan never talks to the media. Steve Mills is part of, you know, the Knicks organization and that whole apparatus and their inclination is to not talk about these things. And unless Scott Perry suddenly becomes someone who is willing to, you know, speak publicly about all kinds of things, which I don't really envision happening <laughs> either. Um, I, I would say that if we do hear about how things really went down, it'll be from, you know, Chris Stapps or Giannis. Sure. Sure. Well, so now we, we have, you know, he, he missed all of last season, didn't suit mm -hmm. up at all. He seemed to work on his body a great deal to the point to where people who have seen him in person and had seen him in person prior are really almost shocked at, at the change in body type. Now I don't have enough track record with him to make that much of a call, but within, you know, he's, he's played six games. He's averaging tw uh, 20 and a half points, uh, career high in rebounds at 8.2 and, you know, 2.7 blocks. So on the surface, the, the box score numbers are looking pretty, pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, game to game, though, I'm I keep finding myself 
underwhelmed, which doesn't seem fair to a guy who's missed this much time. Um, what what are your early reads on how he's playing? Um, so I've caught the Mavericks, I think, three times so far this year. I watched them against the Blazers, the Lakers, and the Nuggets. You got the um, and full it, gambit then. That those yeah. were that's kind of the whole range of how he's played. I think. Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's very similar to the kinds of things you saw with the Knicks. There are stretches where he just completely takes over the game and is unbelievable, and not just because of himself scoring. Even though obviously the the capability to score and score in bunches and score in a variety of different ways is there, but he makes. He has a lot of those kind of end-to-end plays where he'll either block a shot and then do something ridiculous on the other end or the other way around where he'll Mm -hmm. make like a 30-foot three and then block a shot coming over from the weak side and then get a tip dunk on a fast break going the other way. He has these stretches where it looks like, oh, my God, like what can you even do with this guy? And then he has stretches where, you know, on a couple possessions in a row, he'll take like a post-up fadeaway that, you know, it's not necessarily a good shot or he'll take – one of those 30 foot threes, but it's with 12 seconds left on the shot clock and it doesn't really need to be taken in that situation. And like, he can make those threes at a pretty decent rate, but also like if there's 12 seconds left on the shot clock, even if you do have two or three feet of space, especially with a player like Luka Doncic on the team, you can probably get a better shot than that on that specific possession. Um, I would say, I don't necessarily think he looks much different than he did before. Like I don't, I'm not seeing, many ill effects of the ACL. He still looks like a really good athlete. He still is moving around pretty mm-hmm. well, certainly much better than you would expect, uh, you know, a gangly seven foot three guy to move around. Um, I think he's always been, you know, more athletic than he looks just in terms of his ability to move in short spaces and certainly his ability to jump and just be like an above the rim player. Typically guys that are that tall mm-hmm. are above the rim players just because they're tall and like KP gets up um and we'll you know jump over guys for tip dunks and things like that and i think i've seen a lot of that um during the games that i watched of him in dallas he gets up so high and you know we talk about this in in a slack channel you and i are both in the way he lands is still horrifying to me because oh, yeah. mm-hmm. he, he's like a he's like a giraffe jumping over a fence and i i i just i still worry that we're gonna we're gonna see a lower another lower body extremity injury but he's just he's he is very athletic and that's it's it's kind of shocking to see at points. Uh, you know, if you were to give, you know, based on you know the, the previous season, not necessarily what he's shown, you know, now, what 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 do you what sort of scouting report would you give on him offensively? What is he good at? I'm having the reason I ask is I'm I'm having a little bit of a hard time understanding how the Mavericks are using him mm-hmm. because the shots he seems to like are counter to the shots that the Mavericks talk about what they want to get in terms of you know, the, the, basically the, the standard now, the at the rim, the three point shots, and they go to a fair number of ISOs for him. Sometimes I think for confidence reasons. So what, what is he, you know, what's the scouting report on him? If, if, you know, for the things that he's excels at offensively. I would say the, the one thing that he's best at is not even something that he does himself. It's creating space for whoever is the ball handler when he's on the floor. Like if you look at the the Derrick Rose resurgence that he's had as a, you know, passable player, it started as being the point guard on a team with Chris Stapps because, you know, very much like Dirk, teams give Chris Stapps stay attached coverage on essentially every pick and pop that he has. So a ball handler who runs a pick and pop with Chris Stapps sort of has free reign to wherever they want to go off of that screen. That was true with Derrick Rose. That was true with guys like, you know, Jerry Grant or Jose Calderon or any of the other point guards that he played with in New York. Um, So the the biggest thing he does is give ball handlers free reign to step into a pull-up three or get into the paint and bend the defense or get all the way to the rim. And that obviously is a huge boon for a team's offense Um, and you're seeing that with luca right now Mm -hmm. i think that there's a link between luca's you know uptick in scoring particularly around the rim compared to what he was getting last season even if to me and i do want to discuss this a little more in a bit i don't know Mm -hmm. if luca and him are really working that well together on pick and rolls yeah i mean i would say that it's 
the the uptick in his ability to get to the rim is almost certainly related. Like I think you're seeing, I was looking at this the other day. He's taking like in the high twenties uh, percentage of his shots within three feet of the basket, as opposed to like twenty percent last last season. And his finishing numbers there are better too. I would say a bunch of that is connected to KP, and then just the assist numbers too, because if the help is not coming from the guy guarding the screener, it has to come from somewhere else. And that means somebody's open and Luca sees everybody who's open before they're open. So I'd say the assist numbers have something to do with that as well. Um, so just, just the ability to create space for anybody else on the floor with him is the biggest thing that KP does well offensively. And then obviously, I mean, his range is essentially limitless. You know, he can mm-hmm. comfortably take 35 foot threes without changing his form at all um and this year from what i remember he's hitting them at a higher rate than he did in either of his first two seasons and at a comparable rate to what he did in that third season which was probably you know his best um to that point um so so on offense it's the combination of the range and the threat just make things so much easier for everybody else uh on offense and um he obviously brings the ability to be a significant threat as an offensive re- rebounder and specifically as being like a tip dunk guy. He gets a lot of those and those kind of things, and I think. Um, and then just because he's so tall, he is able to get any shot he wants in, you know, an isolation or post-up situation because literally all he has to do is turn around and take a shot and nobody can block it because it's so high up in the air. Um, right he's not necessarily um a great shot maker in some of those situations and i think specifically short mid-range shots have been tough for him over the years i don't know what it is about them but he's not been very good at them in my experience but the ability to get them like if he wants a shot it is there for him to get somebody pointed out to me once and and I and I, I I can't unsee it to a degree. The short mid range shots are fascinating to me because he seems to really like them. He mm-hmm. seems to like have, in, have have inherited some of Carmelo and uh, Anthony's tendencies without Carmelo Anthony's shot making ability. Is that a crazy thing to say? I think Melo was a little bit more of the mid to long range mid range shots, whereas Kristaps is like, you know, he's posting up maybe a foot or two outside of the paint and like when he turns around there's like he's already open Mm -hmm. because whoever is guarding him (laughs) is like naturally going to be six or seven inches shorter than him and you know when you see an open shot from that range like it seems like you should just be able to make it uh but for whatever reason he has just not been very good at them in his career like the you know 12 to 15 footers um he's been better in most seasons at the deep mid-range shots you know a couple steps inside the three-point line if he you know rolls to the nail or gets a a pick and pop and he's just inside the line or something like that um he generally prefers to pop outside the line but if he does pop inside the line like i think he's been better at those than he has been at you know the post-up turnarounds Mm -hmm, mm-hmm mm-hmm this is this is all exactly why I wanted to bring you on because my next question I'm going to ask you I'm having Jonathan Sharks on later in the week I'm going to ask him I've asked Josh Bo to look into this I'm sure if he doesn't someone in the Mavs community is going to steal this and look into it I'm really fascinated as to what Porzingis can get better at and the one specific thing I want to ask you is does he know how to set a screen <laughs> um I would say Yes, he does. And specifically when he was a rookie, they would use him as an off ball screener for Carmelo a lot. And that would work pretty well. And then Carmelo screening for him off the ball too. Uh, But a lot of times in pick and rolls or pick and pops, it's just better for him to slip because it forces the defense into a quicker decision. And if that guy stays with him, then all of a sudden like Luca's going to beat his man off the dribble 90 95 percent of the time if there's no help there especially 
Um, and if they both go with if they both uh, go with Luca, then it's quicker for him to be you know at the rim or at the nail or at the three point line. So a lot of times the slipping is like kind of what should be done for a guy who's that big and that good of a shooter. It's the same reason where like KD when he sets a screen basically never makes contact and slips right away. Also, it's the same really? reason Carmelo when he would set a screen would slip right away most of the time. You know, but there then, are times when it's better for him to stay there and set a screen, and he probably should. But I think a lot of times the slipping is strategic. But the sl- so the slipping though of the screen, he's not the primary beneficiary. Then it's the ball handler because yeah. he's pulling his man away. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a lot of times why the ball handlers that play with him have such free reign to the paint. It's you're forcing that guy guarding him into making such a quick decision, and most of the time he's going to choose not to give up the three to his own man, and uh, and that lets the ball handler get a little bit of an edge because usually you'd have someone in that spot providing a little bit of help and allowing the ball handler's guy to recover from the screen and get to him. But with KP, a lot of times they don't have that time because the screener's man is not in that position. That's really interesting. And I use, and one of the things I've been thinking about, and I I'm glad you've explained this to me is in a harsh comparison point, there's somebody like Boban who mm-hmm. rolls to the basket every time. And when he rolls, they've been, you know, uh, Luca has basically been riding him, you know, like he keeps his man on his hip and then he can either get like a short floater or he can just like lob it up and and throw it down to Boban. And I've kind of wondered why they haven't done that more with Porzingis, because I feel I feel like Porzingis hasn't gotten many easy looks at the rim this year. Almost all of his Mm -hmm. looks, if, if they do run a pick and roll with him where he rolls to the basket, it's always been on the side. And I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, now I mean, it, it, somebody it posted a video. Luka. Yeah. And somebody posted a video of them running uh, a bunch of side pick and rolls and was talking about how it's essentially unstoppable because of the combination of the two skill sets. And it really is like it was the same reason why most of the, you know, Steph KD or Russ KD pick and rolls were side pick and rolls because you clear out that whole side and have the guy, you know, slip or pop to the baseline. And it's an impossible decision. And you're either, you're giving up Luca getting right to the rim or a short jumper for KP or a dunk for KP. Like, what That's do you want to give up in that situation? Yeah, that, <laughs> it's, that it's actually, really difficult. That does answer a little bit of my next question, but I, I, I think I'm still going to ask it anyways. So due to how he left New York, I've been kind of preoccupied with the concept of keeping Porzingis happy. And the the concept of keeping him happy when he is clearly not even close to Don, Doncic right now on on mm-hmm. you know the the pecking order, how is there anything they can do the Mavericks being to use him better offensively that would you know get him some easier looks at the basket? He's only shooting forty three percent from the field, which for a seven foot three guy just doesn't look good. Even though he's you know sh- nearly shooting thirty nine percent from three. Is there anything they can do that that could could use him better or, or that would result without taking away what they're clearly doing? Because the Mavericks are one of the best offenses in the league right now. Yeah, I would say that, you know, just in terms of keeping him happy and not being, you know, close to Doncic's level, this is something that we've talked about, you and me, separately. Um, like, you can still be, you know, a quote-unquote dynamic duo, even if one guy is clearly better. You know, the Splash Brothers are the Splash Brothers, even though Steph is clearly better than Clay. And, you know, it was still Jordan and Pippen or Shaq and Kobe or things like that. And and I think they can still be a duo. And I think the Mavericks are very much selling them as a duo. And I think that's probably purposeful. Um, you know, in terms of getting him better looks, I think some of that is probably the injury. Um, this is not something I've looked up, but I would bet – He's popping out off of screens significantly more than he rolls. And that oh, yeah. was true anyway. But I would bet that the numbers are ratcheted up even more. And that's something that is probably, at least in part, due to the knee. Um, and I'm I'm actually looking at the numbers right now. His rookie season, 21% of his shots came within three feet of the rim. This season, it's 11%. And, you know, 
some of the difference is taking more threes, but a lot of the difference is he's taking a bunch more shots from three to 10 feet away. I think as he gets healthier, he'll get, you know, closer to the rim a little bit more. And he's always been an incredible finisher in the immediate area of the basket. Um, And I think that, that that will bring his field goal percentage up as he gets closer and closer to the rim a little bit more. So some of that is just, um, as he works his way back from injury. And I think some of it is going to be, you know, having him be sort of the, the guy that anchors second units, which I think that they've been doing a pretty decent job of so far. Um, He's got to work his way into better shots himself, not settle as often for the, Oh, I'm, you know, 15 feet away. I can put this up if I want to, you know, work a jab step, take two dribbles and try to get to the rim and get yourself fouled or, you know, finish at the basket or dunk on somebody. Uh, So I think it's a combination of the injury and a combination of him, you know, when he's the guy on the floor, who's being trusted to create offense, just being willing to, to work for a better shot than the one that's right in front of him. Sure. Uh, my, my favorite thing that, that he does, and I tend to harp on really dumb things every year. I just like find one thing with, with every player. And I'm like, why does this player do that? He dribbles left into traffic so frequently. It's, it's, it's amazing. Cause he does have a pretty good handle for a guy that size, but mm-hmm. I think it, he gets a little cute. And, and I think the force that's what I'm kind of looking forward to returning is he, he plays with a lot of finesse and that's fine. He's, he's always going to be that kind of player, but I remember seeing enough highlights to where he was more of a forceful guy taking the basket with a little bit of strength and he just hasn't really done that yet, but he also hasn't gotten too many opportunities. So like you said, I I hope he, he rounds into shape here. Well, this has been just about everything. I could have Also just, um, I would say just a lot of times with those drives where he gets himself, into trouble a lot of times it's because he decides that he's going to drive before he gets the ball he's like i'm driving on this possession when i get the ball um and he would benefit more from being able to read the defense that's in front of him and i think you're seeing that a little bit with his i think his assist numbers are higher than they've ever been he was not just flat out not a good passer in new york and some of that is because you know, when you're a big man, naturally you're not as good of a passer. And mm-hmm. the way he was used early in his career was not conducive to him making plays. Um, so it, it's good to see him get his assist numbers up a little bit. I don't think he's ever going to be a guy who's, you know, like Draymond on the short roll making plays all over the place. But if he can get into the two to three assist range instead of the one to two assist range, mm-hmm. I think that will be a big benefit um, for him and for everybody who shares the floor with him just because it'll force defenses to just have that in the back of their mind that he might be getting rid of this ball when he's on the drive. Yeah. Ben Falk kind of knocked the Mavericks uh, statistical crew for, for attributing him to us and the assists that he probably didn't earn, which tickled me to no end, but <laughs> I'd be happy with him getting a positive assist to turnover ratio that that's, <laughs> it seems like an easy goal, you know, maybe half of assist more game just, just so that the threat is there, but he's, he's mm-hmm. a really interesting player to watch. I, it's nice to see him be able to recover in with having, you know, Luca as the safety valve so that there's not too much on him too quickly. There's mm-hmm. there it's it's incredible that the guy's posting, you know, essentially a 20 and 9 or I guess 20 and 8 8 uh averages right now and I see a lot of room for growth. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean the one thing I would be watching out for honestly is on the other end of the floor. Um he's been since he entered the league like one of the best rim protectors in the NBA Um, consistently excellent rim protection numbers. I haven't looked at those this year. I'm sure they're probably pretty good. Again, I know the Mavericks defense hasn't been um, exactly elite, Um, (laughs) but I would imagine that he will retain the ability to protect the rim just because like you don't lose being seven, three and having really long arms. Um, The thing that to watch out for to me is his ability to guard in space. That was already an issue for him. Stretch fours were sort of an issue for him. Um, Specifically, like Kevin Love would just, every single time that the Knicks played the Cavs, Kevin Love would destroy him Um, because he would just have to make too many movements from the paint to the perimeter to the paint to the perimeter in a row. And it's just not something that a guy that big is built to do. Um, And it's just like, you're not going to be able to change direction that many times in quick succession. Um, 
And I, and I think crowning ball handlers in space and being able to run a guy off the line and still contain the drive, that to me is the thing that is the single most important thing you could work on to take him to another level because he's going to be big and he's going to be able to shoot, I think, for the rest of his career. Actually playing with Doncic, he's going to have considerably more open shots than he ever did when he was with the Knicks just because the Knicks never had somebody who could create like Luka can create. Mm-hmm. Um and I think he's going to be able to protect the rim too. So, I mean, the next step is being able to erase space on defense the way he can create it on offense. Yeah, the Mavericks, the way the team is built, I've kind of chosen to ignore defense and the things that I'm that I'm paying attention to big picture because they don't, the the way the, the, the team is built, there's just not, they have a lot of really interesting help defenders but I don't think there's a single guy on the team that's even like remotely good at man-to-man defense. Maybe Dorian Finney-Smith, but he just seems to get cooked by everybody. And plus, it, it, with the way the NBA is nowadays, offense is simply more valuable. I mean, the Maverick. Oh, yeah. I want to say that all. I want to say like the that of the 15 playoff teams last year, all the the offensive rating, the teams with offensive ratings were just simply much more successful. And so if if Dallas can even become passable on defense, then I think that that will really work itself out. But the way Carlisle plays, he plays, you know, 11 guys a lot of the time. And they're still there. It's going to be 20 games until they figure out what, you know, what some of their rotations are at least more functional. So, you know, they got a lot of room for growth. I'm I'm looking forward to watching it. Yeah, uh, me too. And I would also just say, like, generally, young teams are as good at defense, uh, especially when, you know, your best players are young guys, and that's the case for the Mavs. So I would say it's very reasonable to expect them to be better at defense, you know, when Luka gets his max extension than at the start of KP's. Mm -hmm. Well, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but the Knicks and the Mavericks play like twice in the next like 14 days, Mm -hmm. something like that. They play on Friday in Dallas, then they play in New York. I want to say the next week or the week after that. I can't remember entirely. Yeah, it's next Thursday. That'll be really interesting. So uh, is, you know, what what is going on with the Knicks in, in short order? Are they... As much of a mess as it looks on paper, or is is you know is it just a young team that needs to figure things out? A little bit of both. I mean, they are one of the youngest teams in the league. They're not quite as young as they were last year when they were like the eighth youngest team of the last forty years, or something <laughs> like that. Um, that's seriously, they were I think the either the seventh or eighth youngest team of the three point era, which is going back to nineteen seventy nine, eighty. So they were, you know, the eighth youngest team in the last 40 years. This year, I think their their minutes weighted age is like one year older. So now they're the second or third youngest team in the league. So a lot of that is why you're so discombobulated out there. You have so many young guys playing such a big role. It's it's hard, um, you know, to be all that good of a team when <laughs> that's the case. Um, some of it is, you know, a lot of new guys early in the season teams that don't have a lot of continuity, you know, sometimes you come out like gangbusters right away. Sometimes it takes you a while to get into rhythm. Some of it is um, they don't have very good point guards, period. And two Mm -hmm. of them have been out of the lineup. Um, You know, Dennis Smith Jr. unfortunately had a death in the family and Alfred Payton uh, has been injured. So really the only point guard on the roster right now is Frank Nilakina, who I don't really think the organization necessarily considers him a point guard. Um, so RJ Barrett has been playing some point guard, like when Frank's not in the game, like they've used backcourts where like Wayne Ellington is bringing the ball up the court. Um, so I, I think there's a myriad reasons of why they're discombobulated, but also just like, look, this is a team that won 17 games last year. I don't care how many guys you sign in the off season. It's extremely unlikely you're going to be all that good the next season. I did a, a study about this a few years ago when the last time they won 17 games, and I found that, you know, of the 55 teams that had won between 14 and 20 games in a full season, you know, they averaged 17 wins and the next year they averaged 27 wins. So I would say that's, you know, the the median expectation for a team like this, you know, it was just not very likely that they were going to be all that good. Um, and, you know, to me, in the modern NBA, if you don't have a point guard or at least a lead ball handler, that's good. You know, the the Mavericks point guards are okay. Like, I'm a big DeLon Wright fan, but essentially they're 
point guard is Luca, so that's yeah. why their offense is good. If you don't have a point, a good point guard, you're not going to have a good offense. And if you're young and don't have you know one guy that can transform a defense, you're not going to be a good defense. And if you're not a good offense and you're not a good defense, you're not good. And that's where the Knicks are right now. Well, before we get out of here, I want to give you a chance to pub anything you're working on. Let's start with your your really interesting and fun project, Last Night in Basketball, and then anything else that you've written lately uh, that we should go check out. Sure, yeah. Um, last Night in Basketball essentially started as like a video breakdown series that I did last year, and I'm still doing this year. It's uh, twice a week from now until the All-Star break, Wednesdays and Fridays. Then from the All-Star break to the start of the playoffs, it's Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And then during the playoffs, it's after every night of games. Essentially, I take one of the games I work, I watched the night before and just break down either a, t- a, a player or a play or a team and what happened and sort of you know make it easily digestible for people to watch. And then you know in addition to that this year, I'm also doing a project where I'm just writing 500 words about the NBA every single day, including, you know, all of the off days and all the days where it seems like nothing happens and all of the days off during the week that we get off for the all-star break and all the off days, you know, in the middle of the second round when the, the Mavericks Spurs series is over, but we're waiting to see, you know, who the Suns are going to play in the Western conference finals. Um, So I'm just going to be writing 500 words about the NBA every single day from now until the last day of the NBA finals. Yeah, And then, um, you know, my work, you could find it generally all over the place. I'm doing a lot at 538 this season. I'm doing a lot at the step back this season. I'm sure you'll see me pop up, you know, other places throughout the year. Um, yeah. And uh, basically, if you if you follow me on Twitter, which I don't suggest doing, but if you go to my account, I now have um, – a couple of links on there, one for last night in basketball and one for an archive of just all of my NBA writing where it is this year and where it has been in previous years. And I think if, there's like an ability to follow on that link or something like that. And yep. you could just get all of the work there. Now my, my fa- I'm looking at it right now, my favorite, and it's just highlighting NBA features and analysis, 500 articles sorted by date. Uh, <laughs> we're talking a lot of stuff over the years and, you know, I, I really cannot recommend the 538 work enough. Jared, Jared's been taking some really, you know, the, the, the piece you did on, on, on the, you know, fouls early in the season is really interesting and how that, mm-hmm. those trends and that sort of stuff tracks. It's really, it's it, Jared's just always working on something and, you know, in the, the day and age where it feels like, you know, we, we, we've gone from the extreme where, you know, 10 years ago, people were writing all the time to now where, you know, there's calendarized stuff and people are writing, you know, easier topics. I am, I may or may not be one of these people <laughs> that tends to write a lot of formulaic stuff. So writing every day is really, really hard. Um, thank you again for coming on. I appreciate it. I hope we can maybe, you know, circle back later in the year if the Mavericks uh, turn out to be as interesting as they're looking. Yeah, thank you for having me. I would be happy to come back on, and I would be happy if this team was as interesting as they look. I think it's an interestingly built team. Obviously, Luca is going to be one of the best players in the NBA for a long time, and they've got you know a running mate for him, and they've got you know a bunch of interesting players around him. You know, specifically guys that I like to watch, which makes them you know a team that I keep in my rotation of teams that I'm watching uh, pretty heavily, especially. You know, last year, I would say I watched them more than I should have given their place in the league. And I think that that will continue this year. Yep. Yep. Well, we're getting out. I have literally 40 seconds until my recording expires. So I'm going to let Jared go. (laughs) Everybody check us out. We're going to be continuing to do these post game recaps, rate, review, subscribe, do all the things, you know, the drill. Everybody have a good day. This has been Kirk, your enthusiasm. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. 
With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical.